In 1999, the movie world was abuzz because one of the most popular and successful film franchises of all time was planning some new installments. More than 20 years after the release of Star Wars, George Lucas was making more movies about the evil empire and the rebel alliance and the Jedi Knights and the Force. However, instead of moving the story forward, Lucas was making prequels to the existing movies. He was going backwards rather than forwards. And just now, we are watching, literally, the same phenomena with the movie trilogy series, The Hobbit, which is a prequel to The Lord of the Fly... The the Lord of the Rings, excuse me, Lord of the Rings series that was already produced. So in a similar fashion, what I want us to do this Advent season is to focus on a prequel story to the event of Christmas in Bethlehem. It involves one of the five women named by Matthew in the genealogy of Jesus. Each of these women tainted the line of the Messiah with a blemish. First there's Tamar, daughter-in-law of Judah, who got pregnant when he hired her as she pretended to be a cult prostitute. Rahab, who was a whore in Jericho, who saved the lives of the spies who were there before they entered into the promised land. Bathsheba, who committed adultery with King David. Ruth, a Moabite woman who was a widow and Mary, a young girl pregnant before she was married. Now our Advent prequel is going to focus on Ruth out of those five. And her life as she lived it in Bethlehem. And how she became the great grandma to King David, from whom Jesus the Messiah, the Savior of the world, came. Ruth's story starts with a famine in Bethlehem, which is a little piece of irony in the story. Since the name Bethlehem literally means city of bread. Now a little bit of geography for us so we have a setting. We know Jerusalem is the holy city. It sits on one of the high points of a mountain in a series of mountain ranges that stretch down to the Dead Sea. Bethlehem is a little town about five miles south of that holy city. Now the book of Ruth really takes the form of a classic short story in Hebrew literature. The book is found early in the Old Testament order. Sometimes it's hard to find because of that. First it's a short book and then it comes a lot sooner than you think it would. It serves almost as a counterpoint to the era of the judges, which is the section of the Bible that it's found in. Ruth helps us to make a shift 
from the emphasis of tribal living to the family unit or the family level. The story begins with Elimelech, an Israelite, who married Naomi. And together they had two sons. Times got hard in Bethlehem with the famine. So they picked up and traveled to the land of the Moabites to find food. That was a very peculiar choice. A little bit of background, again, so we understand this. Moab was the son of incest, if we remember. Between Lot, who was the nephew to Abraham, who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, remember that? and Lot's oldest daughter. This happened after they were able to escape the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah that God rained down upon them. Both of Lot's daughters manipulated him with alcoholic drink in order for them to get pregnant by him. Moab was the son of the oldest daughter, and Ammon was the son of the youngest daughter. Now the Moabites and the Ammonites were outcast to the Jews and to the Israelites. And all during the Old Testament narrative story, there is always warring contention between the Moabites and the Israelites, the Ammonites, and the Israelites. And that's probably a good place to make our first stop in analyzing this story. Because as we look at Elimelech and his family moving to Moab, the story does not mention the fact that they're moving because of faith reasons. They're not moving because they are being guided by God. That's a great understanding for us. Because when we make decisions, maybe by whim, or because of personal lusts or desires, or at least without any deep spiritual consideration, many times that is our first step into troubles in life. Moab turned out to be a bad move for this family. First of all, both of the boys marry Moabite women. That means they're marrying outside of the Jewish custom and law. You might remember that all of the reform efforts of Ezra and Nehemiah included condemnation for this violation of marrying outside of the faith. And Ezra and Nehemiah demanded that such relationships be ended to regain the purity of God's people. Elimelech's sons were part of that. And then Elimelech and his two sons die, leaving the women as widows without any proper care by men in a foreign land that is hostile to Jews. They're in trouble. Now today, that might not be such a problem. And I know sometimes, you know, with the attitudes today, women can read this and just kind of wince a little bit. It's not such a huge thing today. But then, that was huge. In the modern world, the roles for men and women have kind of blended together and morphed. 
Women are much more independent today and truly are capable in our culture to live alone and be successful. But in the ancient world, men and women each had specific roles and responsibilities to fill. And without a man, a woman had little security and no safety net to catch her. Women were vulnerable and alone without a man. And that's precisely why God established some specific laws concerning widows and orphans among his people, the Israelites. So Naomi and her daughters are in a tough situation. They're in a bad way. And that's when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had now blessed his people back in Judah by giving them good crops again. In other words, the famine was over. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab and return back to her homeland. But make no mistake about it, that was not an easy journey. That was not an, a quick decision to make. On the way, Naomi decides to release her daughters-in-law from any obligation they might feel to her so that they might return and regroup with their own people. And Orpah takes <coughs> Naomi up on that offer. But Ruth chooses to stay with Naomi with that infamous quote in verses 16 and 17. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death would separate me and you. Now that's a, a touching sentiment, and today, frequently, that quote gets used at weddings. It's become a a romantic byline almost today. But what I want us to do is just kind of take a look at its origin. Because it had nothing to do with the romance between a man and a woman originally. Originally, this is a statement from a daughter-in-law to a mother-in-law. Imagine that. And try that one on for size in the right perspective today. Hmm? And this is maybe our second stopping point, this great statement of faith. It seems to me that Naomi must have made a strong, favorable faith impression on Ruth. Right? I mean, her life must have served as a witness to Ruth in a life-changing way for Ruth. Even without any way for Naomi to support or protect them, Ruth wanted to live by Naomi's faith. She wanted to live in the security of Naomi's God. My guess is that that's because of Naomi's love. Ruth was touched by the love of God in Naomi. And Ruth did not want to part from that love. She was going to make that love part of her life. In Naomi, you see, she saw that that love trumped all loss and pain and grief. That love trumped all despair and depression and hopelessness. 
That love pulled people in and did not push people away. It's a love that she had not encountered ever before. And she did not want to lose that love. Paul tells us that faith, hope, and love, those three are what abide. And so the question in our lives in relationship to thinking of Naomi is how many people see faith and hope and love in us and it changes their lives? Faith, hope, and love come together like a pyramid or a triangle. They're strong like a braided cord. Faith and hope and love united are what allow us to face tomorrow with no fear. And without those three, people will simply give up and die. Now Naomi's faith had been tested in Moab. She was nearly hopeless in her plight. Her husband was gone. Her two sons were gone. She was without any means to move into the future. As a widow, she was considered a burden in her culture. But she still loved her daughters-in-law. And with that love in her heart, enough faith gathered in her to offer her hope that she would be able to survive if she would go back to Bethlehem, if she would return home. Now Ruth watched Naomi in this and was willing to bet her life on Naomi's faith and hope and love to the point that she was willing to leave behind her own family, her own culture, and her own land, which were the obvious normal sources for her help and hope in the world. Ruth was converted. And now she was pledging faith where Naomi found faith and hope. And she wanted to live and love the way Naomi lived and loved. You see, Ruth was redeemed way before Boaz. Now faith is the channel for courage in our lives. We read about the names of faith in the great Hall of Fame chapter of Hebrews 11. Each of those named had the courage of faith to conquer kingdoms or administer justice or face giants or face the fire or face lions or put armies to flight or take life-threatening risks on and on and on. You see, such courage and faith is what gives rise to hope. And hope is what will deliver us into tomorrow. After that great chapter 11, chapter 12 starts off like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now, he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. So Naomi and Ruth, Return to Bethlehem. And Naomi is greeted 
by old friends. And it's in Bethlehem here where we can see the power of loving fellowship. Everyone welcomes her return. But Naomi says, don't call me Naomi now. And the name Naomi itself means pleasant. Life is not pleasant for me, says Naomi. My life has become bitter. You should call me Mara. I left here full, but I have returned here empty. My spirit is broken, and I am bitter. Now, unlike the move to Moab, God has initiated the return to Bethlehem. And now Naomi is exactly where she needs to be. It took all of her faith to get her back to Bethlehem. And she arrived there empty. But God has her where she can draw on the love and the faith of her home and community and family. And she can regain her hope. This Advent season, 2013, God is calling us, first of all, back to Bethlehem, to the birthplace of the Savior, to the fulfillment of God's promise of Emmanuel, God with us, so that we would never be alone. Indeed, God's love came down at Christmas. That was the purpose of Christmas, that God would be with us always. Jesus said to his followers, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. I am the way and the truth and the life. There is no other way to live life full of faith and hope and love except in Him. God's calling us to Bethlehem. And God's calling us to Christian fellowship. Calling us out of the hostile world where we find ourselves. The land where we are and live in, but not really our homeland. And he's calling us to the place where we can be strengthened by family and friends in the community of the church where our faith can be lifted and supported and where we can give up bitterness and emptiness and find life to the full. There is no promise that will exempt us from life's difficult situations. But life does not have to be empty and bitter for us. Because in the fellowship of God and God's people, we can be surrounded by faith and hope. So don't dismiss how this first chapter in Ruth ends. 
on a high note of expectation for tomorrow. It's the flower of hope from the tiny seed of faith that sprouted and encouraged Naomi and Ruth's long, hard journey back to Bethlehem. It says, So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. And they arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. To God be the glory for his timing in our lives. I'm going to pass out to you, the ushers are going to help me now, I'm going to pass out to you a handout each week in Advent, it's my goal to have a handout for us. This handout is intended to do this. It's intended to take the word that we have just heard from God and guide some of our thinking to how we can bring that word into our lives in a life-changing way. So I encourage you to take Take this sheet and find some time in the next day or two while this word is still fresh in our minds and spend some time meditating how God can bring faith and hope and love into our lives. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for this word. Thank you for the encouragement it gives us. That even when we can't see our way through our own eyes, We are reminded that we are not alone. Help us today to see our way through your eyes. In your son's name we pray. Amen.